Romans 3, 21 says, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, oh, keep it up on the screen, any legalistic people in here tonight? And that's a horrible way to live. I used to live like that. That's a tough way to live. That's a heavy burden, man. That's a tough way. Listen, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, meaning they spoke about the righteousness that was to come, okay? Even the righteousness of God through faith. Keep it on the screen. How are you guys going to go home tonight? Anybody? You're all wrong. I heard car, motorcycles. No, you're all, you're all wrong. You got to go through these doors to get home. <laughs> right? Yeah. Through faith. Through faith. You're going to go through those doors. You got to go through those doors to get out there. Listen, you get the righteousness of God through Jesus. Why? Because it's his righteousness. Okay, don't try to dress up your righteousness. You just do circles <laughs> in the sanctuary and you won't be able to make the go out the door. No, listen. Through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. That's radical. That is amazing. Listen, the prodigal father, what else do we learn is that his love is confrontational. And I like this part. Combat love. I'm dead serious. This this is gnarly love. This 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 is amazing love. This combat love. How so? And second, he had compassion. The dad looks, oh, I've been scanning that horizon forever. Here comes that boy. And then listen, listen, the word, listen, it means this. The word compassion is that the father felt it's to have the same, uh, this is kind of a, uh, it's kind of, this is what it means. It's to have the same bowels. You say, are you sure you want to say that in church? It's tough. That's the meaning of the original. Jesus used the word. The father looked at the boy coming back home, and the father's guts began to be touched by that. Things grabbed him. Have you noticed when you're really, really, really in a situation or a relationship, forget about your heart rate increasing. That's a joke. It's your guts. When you're really, really happy or hurting, mostly hurting, it gets you right here. It loosens your guts. The father looked and his heart just melted for his boy. What's this, friends, this is Jesus Christ talking. And Jesus Christ is telling us when you turn toward the father, his heart, his very bowels are moved with compassion for all the pain, grief, and heartache you've gone through. And he's so delighted. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 4, 8, love covers a multitude of sins. Mm. And that's a great thing. Don't you want people to love you? I mean, honestly, really. When people really love you, they overlook so much. Isn't it amazing how messed up we all are? Man, that was a weak response. (laughs) We're messed up. We are messed up. I mean, we're messed up in the, we're so messed up in ways, we don't even think that we're messed up in those ways. (laughs) Think about it. Um, If I'm in an airplane, I have to sit on the window. Not on the window. (laughs) I have to sit at the window. You want to know? Listen, you know, look, I'm not the only one weird in here like this. Why? Because if the plane's going down, I want to see it coming. You say, that's weird. Wait a minute. The guy in the aisle doesn't want to see it's coming. He doesn't want to look. That's weird. Well, then there's the guy in the middle seat. He's really weird. He's, a, he's like lukewarm. He can't figure out what he wants. But we all have our thing. We have our thing. I have to have my napkin folded this way. What's wrong with you? We all have our thing. And when we love each other, what is marriage all about? It's overlooking the interesting parts of the other person. Lisa and I were two babies. 
Two babies of the family should never get married. Why? Because when you're a baby, all the, everybody else picks up after you. So we get married. So we come home, our first day home, and we open the door, and you know, off goes the shirt, and you, I shoot the underwear across the room, and it hits the lamp. And I, my mom always picked that stuff up before. And Lisa's like, hey, what are you doing? I don't know, what are you doing? Well, I mean, we're all weird. Love covers a multitude of sins. Of course, that's funny light stuff, but what about the big stuff? I've had people literally say, well, my wife committed adultery. Guess I have to divorce her. Well, what do you, do you want to divorce her? No, I don't. It breaks my heart. It's, our, our, our vows have been broken, but the Bible, listen, I have grounds for divorce. I got to divorce her now. No, you don't. That's second choice. First choice is love covers a multitude of sins. Hmm? That's serious stuff. Love is strong. Con- uh, it's, it's a combat love. It's a confrontational love. The Bible says in Psalm 91, 1, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Yeah. Listen to the results of this action if you so choose to take it. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge And my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. You can't live and know and see that unless you dwell under the shadow of the Lord's covering. There's that precious place. God becomes your defense. That's and in my opinion, that's confrontational love, meaning this. Look, God brings you in like this, okay? You're right here. And the world comes like this, and God just says, You just stay, you just stay right there back. He just goes like this. Bing. <laughs> That's awesome. You say, how do you get that? Because the father, in his compassion for his prodigal son, that compassion cannot be stopped. A, a mama bear, a mama of anything, will sacrifice itself to protect that baby. And what should only trump that display is a man, is a father. Because that's the picture, listen, if you don't know, friend, that's the picture that God tells us how he is toward you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Based on what? His compassion for the lost. So we should be burdened for the lost. Confrontational love. Would you, will you? And how far will you go to love someone into the kingdom of God? In this sense, I like to believe that our gospel, listen, don't take this wrong, that our gospel is a violent gospel. I don't mean... Let's create a riot. When I say violent gospel, what I'm suggesting is the Bible, God's grace, God's love will pursue you and hound you. The old Puritans used to call the Holy Spirit the hound of heaven. Why? Because he never stops barking to get the attention of a lost person or a wayward child. God's love is not weak. It doesn't sit in the corner and say, well, you know, I don't know, maybe. I don't know, I'm not sure. (laughs) God's love says, get out of my way. I'm going to get that person. Get out of my way. God calls out. God is crying out to you. Calling. Amazing. In Matthew 11, verse 12 This combat gospel, this combat love, confrontational love, I think is displayed in Matthew 11, 12. Jesus said, it's an often misunderstood verse, mind you. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. That is, the gospel's under attack. And the violent take it by force. You can read commentators until the cows come home, and they're completely divided down the middle what that means. 
I'm probably believing what I do believe about it because I'm probably dumb, but when Jesus says from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of God suffers violence, meaning it's a, it, the, the world attacks the kingdom of God because the kingdom, the kingdom of God is, is expanding. The gospel's being preached around the world. People are getting saved. Lives are being changed. But the violent take it by force means that those who seriously take the gospel will not be shut down by a world in opposition to us. Job said it perfectly. Though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. That's, listen, that's believing in the, violently in the gospel. I'm not talking civil disobedience. I'm talking about standing and living out what you believe so that hell is shaken to the core. Yeah. Satan's got to start biting his nails. Wouldn't it be great to get a snapshot of, of all the little minions of hell biting nails and they're having to eat Melantha because you got serious about God? I think that'd be awesome. The third thing is this. His actions are extreme. We're still in verse 20. It says that he ran. The old man ran. Culturally, I told you before, it's against all the rules. You cannot be an old man in the Middle East and run. It's against the rules. A man's glory was his robe. Still is today, by the way. His robe. You're not to see anything. Only the sandals that hold his feet. You can see his feet. Because his dignity is in his robe. You can't run in a robe. The old man pulls up his robe. Kenneth Bailey, a Middle East scholar, lived in the Middle East for many years. He said you'd have to bring it up, you tie it in this certain kind of a knot that's just above your knee. And then you could run. The old man is running. And look, he's running what's implied. By the way, it's kind of cool. It's not in my notes, but it's in the memory. <laughs> the old man, listen, to save this, this, his son's life. Because according to custom... This son dishonored the family and the culture. If he comes to the city limits, the villagers kill him for the father. You've heard of honor killings? So what does the father do? He's scanning. Now do you see a little bit? He's scanning, 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 scanning. When's that boy coming? When's that boy coming? If I don't run and get to him first. Those in the village with righteous indignation, it's true, they're justified, will kill my boy. I got to get there first. And he runs. Can you imagine this old man running? I should have brought a robe out tonight. <laughs> he's running, he's running. An old man, undignified. Scandalous in a way. We'll come to that in a moment, but he's moving. and Oh no, what's right? The old man's flipped. He's gone crazy. What's happened? Someone's hit him in the head. What's going on? Did you see? What's his face? He's running. It's unbelievable. What's Jesus telling you tonight? God has been running after you your whole life. What's wrong with you? He runs. This is extreme. His actions are extreme. Remember, church, the Pharisees are listening to this. They've got to, I, I would give anything to see them as they are just standing there. Okay, we didn't like you to start with. And now, Jesus, you're nuts. Because these guys were legalistic maniacs. And they're tracking kind of so far now. But when they hear of the Father, they, they're, they're not, these guys are not dumb. They're realizing Jesus is talking about God the Father. And he was running to this pig person. Jesus has flipped. The Pharisees have got to be boiling. By the way, don't think that's too far-fetched. Legalists hate the simple gospel. Legalists, religionists can't stand what you believe in. They'll say things like this. It's just too simple. Oh, what would you have me to do? 
Well, jump through some hoops at least. It's just too simple. Listen, it has to be simple. Why? Because what God has purchased cost everything. What do you add to everything? Look, I'm not going to get in a debate about this. Just hear me out. I'm, I'm not, don't email me about this. If you buy an IBM computer, you've got to block out a week to read the manual. I owned a Sony one time, Vio, for about three months. I almost had a heart attack trying to, keep, trying to get the thing to work. Look, I, I'm not picking a computer fight with you. I'm just telling you, there was a price. It was cheap. Affordable. Spent a week reading the manual. I had it for three weeks, and I had to ship it back because it broke. All my life, I've had Max. Never once have I ever unwrapped a manual. You turn it on and the thing starts like, it's, it's like, hi, what do you want to do? Press me right here. Then, yeah, there, okay, there you go. You want breakfast? What's up? It's like, wow, <laughs> this thing's crazy. It does everything. And you don't even open the manual. Why? It's very expensive. Very expensive. But it's all done. <laughs> Salvation. It's very expensive. But it's all done. But what do I do? What do, I, do I press this and then alt command? What? <laughs> Believe in him. Trust him. Watch what happens. It's amazing. His shame. The father's shame is limitless. The fourth action is that he falls on his son's neck. This is actually out of control. To fall on his neck. Don't you think that's an odd term? He fell on his neck? Did the kids survive? <laughs> that's not what it means. He grabbed him. Death squeeze of love. He's got him by the neck. What does this mean? I love it. You, son, are not going anywhere ever again for me. Didn't Jesus say in John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29... You who believe in me, you're in my Father's hands, and you're in my hands, and no one is able to snatch you out of our hands. Yeah. Hallelujah. The, the man falls on his son's neck. Next, his union with his son is scandalous. Why? See the word kissed, and he kissed him. This is his fifth action. He kisses his son. You say, well, that's nice. Middle Easterns, they kiss like that. Yes, they do. That's, they sure do. This is not the word for that kind of kiss. This father, the word means he kissed his son's ears, nose, eyes, mouth, chin, head, forehead, back of his head, behind his ears. He just... <laughs> His boy. <laughs> what does that do to you? What do you think about that? Is this almost, is this kind of hard for you to handle? That, that Jesus is telling the world this is how the Father loves a sinner. And the only people been out of shape are the legalistic guys. I mean, they're over in the corner. They're, they're taken. Prozac or whatever you're supposed to take. They're sucking their thumb. They've got aromatic lotions on their lips. They're trying to cope with this moment. And Jesus is saying, isn't the Father amazing? And every sinner in the house is going, this is fantastic. And every self-righteous individual is saying, this is very undignified. Well, we don't like it. This is blowing our minds. The next thing is, his sacrifice is extravagant. Verse 22. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against you, or sinned against heaven, and in your sight, I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. Verse 22 says, 
But the father said, don't you love that? Father, I got to tell you, hey, uh, hey, snaps his finger, gets attention of his servants. I mean, the kid's talking. Don't you, don't you think that maybe the father should just wait and hear the confession to make sure it's for real? Listen, notice, the word repentance is not even in this parable, is it? It doesn't have to be. Because the boy's actions are repentful. The father already knows it. Father, I'm so sorry. I don't get cup. Hey, get the, let's get some burgers going here. <laughs> get the coals. Get the fire. Get hey. But dad, don't you want to hear this? I already know. I already know your hearts. Does not the Bible tell us that God knows our thoughts before we think them? Yes. The sacrifice is extravagant. The dedicated calf is offered up. The trophy calf. This is no just calf calf. This is not like your recreational calf. This is a calf dedicated. This was something special. And the father says, that's the one we're going to sacrifice. We're going to have a barbecue. And then we're, we're going to end right here. Uh, the third thing is this. It's verses 25 to 32, and it, it'll be quick. It's the prodigal son number two. Hmm. Now, the older, verse 25, the older son was in the field. And as he came, he drew near. And we read it a moment ago. He heard the music. He saw the dancing. He said, what in the world is going on? What's happening? And he's told what's going on. This is remarkable. The prodigal son, listen. This is very serious. You might love to hear about the prodigal father's extravagant love for you. You might love to hear the prodigal son coming back home from the pigsty, repentful. But for us who are already believers, this is a dangerous here moment right now. It's the prodigal son number two. He's the oldest one. Why? We first indicted the first son some studies ago that he wouldn't submit to his father. Remember that? Well, guess what? Prodigal son number two is unwilling to submit to his father also. He doesn't listen to a word his father's saying. What's going on here? He, he looks at his father's face, and instead of rejoicing with his dad over the son coming back, his brother, he's indignant, he's disgusted. What a shameful act. My bonehead brother goes off and squanders stuff, and you look like you're condoning it. You've just forgiven like that? They can't, listen, the legalist can't see. The father was glad and happy? He should have been. He wasn't. Look, he was unwilling to make the right decision. He should have decided under his father's roof, I will adhere to what blesses my dad. Do you live under someone's roof? You abide by their rules, as long as they're godly rules. It's a sad day in America when a nine-month-old grows up to be a nine-year-old that grows up to a 19-year-old and then tells mom and dad to get out. My dear friends, that is the definition of a lost culture. This older son was unwilling to make the right decisions. He was unwilling to face the outcome. He was completely shocked by the results. Grace won the day, and this man's about ready to vomit. And he was unwilling to repent. Here's the amazing thing. The father lavishes love on both boys. The, bo the father pleads with both boys. The, bo the father's example is extravagant toward both. You know who's the loser in the end of this parable? The son that never wandered away from home. His heart was never in it. He disdains his father. He even, in a derogatory form, says, This son of yours. 
He's expecting things for himself. He's based on works. He's based on performance and self-righteousness. How come you didn't give, ever, give me a calf or a goat ever to party with my friends? You hear this? Do you hear this? A self-consumed life. Both these sons are prodigals. Only one got it, and the other one didn't. We end right here, verse 18. Just look back at verse 18. That, that younger boy, the younger son, said, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against God and you. And so he arose and came to his father. He arose and he came to his father. Do you hear the words of Jesus? Jesus, listen, is saying to us tonight, have you arisen and come to the father? We cannot do this message and end it without the opportunity for you to decide on Jesus tonight. It'd be remiss of me. I, I wish that we were in a different format tonight. Maybe we'll come back together next Wednesday night for Q&A on this. Listen, why you think all week long you come back next week, why would you not accept this offer of Jesus is to arise and come to your father? The only, why, the only reason why you wouldn't come is because you're full of yourself. And don't you see, don't you know you've become a kingdom unto yourself and you're the tyrant. These Pharisees got it. In the parable, what became of the young son? Apparently he repented and uh, he's well with his father. What became of the, of the second son, the legalist? If we follow Jesus' parable all the way through, in the setting with the Pharisees present, what did the Pharisees wind up doing to the Father, to the Father who forgives and asks us to simply come to him? What did the Pharisees do? Listen, Peter tells us in the book of Acts that God the Father sent his Son, but you, by your wicked hands, beat to death, or beat and crucified to death the Son of glory. If this parable was to be played out all the way, the second Son would have beaten the Father and the Son to death in the name of religion, in the name of their belief. Father, tonight we pray, Lord, that in our lives we would make the right decision.